So um, hello everyone. I see we have um, um, two people just joined. Um, welcome to the third um, post-conference Nobuche Collaborative Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Bakar Kanu and I am an Associate Professor at Winston-Salem State University. Uh, my area of expertise is um, analytical chemistry. We will be having a conversation today on um, doing undergraduate research in a pandemic environment. Today's um, topic will be beneficial to um, undergraduate students, whether you are engaged in research right now or not. And it will also be beneficial to graduate students and um, postdoctoral fellows um, and faculty and even administrators will also benefit from some of the conversations we'll have today. I will be serving as the, mo as the moderator of this session. And um, I have two panelists with me, uh, Dr. John Mann and um, Dr. Aseta Shula. They will get to introduce themselves in due time. So for now, I'm gonna start with a small activity. And these are things that we'll discuss later on, but um, if you look at the, the chat box, I'm going to type in a website there and also a code. So the website is uh, menti.com. All right. The website is menti.com and then the code is um, one seven four seven zero four six. All right, so if you go to that website and then type in that code, there will be a question on um, what are your thoughts on um, why undergraduate um, research is helpful to students. So I don't, we're gonna talk about this later on, but I just want to get some idea of where we are on those on that topic before we go into the presentation i'm going to share my screen so we can look at the responses So if you have more than one thought, you can opt, you can enter up to three options. You can use um, short phrases as responses and that should be good. So discover, discover increase knowledge. But Professional development, that's great. Career development, technical developments. Those are very good. 
we have all experience. I'll give about 30 seconds more so we can have some more thoughts if anybody have some more, any more thoughts. <clears throat> Prepare for a career, teamwork, excellence, increase knowledge. Okay. So thank you everyone for your participation. Those are all good um, ideas of why um, our undergraduates should be engaged in research. Um, so let's, we'll, we'll talk about those um, ideas later on, but that, for now, let's continue with the conversation. So um, for those of you who have no idea what um, Nobeche Collaborative is, uh, let me give a brief overview. Um, we formed the Nobeche Collaborative Roundtable in 2017 as an avenue to develop a pipeline for um, academic opportunities for Nobeche undergraduate, um, graduate, and postdoctoral members. Um, our primary focus was to help achieve Nobeche's overall mission and improve um, representation of people of color in academia. The collaborative consists of six institutions, namely um, Auburn University, um, Ampton University, Jackson State University, the Ohio State University, University of Pittsburgh, and Winston-Salem State University. In 2018, the partner institutions established an annual conference that provides a novel means of fostering diverse um, and inclusive um, environment for STEM opportunities to a collective impact model. From the image as you're seeing on the screen here, you can see and uh, the color coded of these six institutions. The ones in red are HBCUs and the ones in blue are either um, PWIs or MSI institutions. To achieve our goals, we have established the following objectives for the collaborative. And the objectives include we um, share best practices among partner institutions for retention purposes. We provide academic and professional placement for students at each stage of their career. We also support students financially. We provide internships where necessary and other support necessary for student success. We recruit jointly to improve the academic pipeline. We are also establishing micro networks of um, relationships. The ones I mentioned about um, um, the conference that we established in 2018, that is one avenue where we are establishing micro networks. And also, we want each partner to determine objectives and activities, most importantly, on their own. So we are, um, each institution has a particular role they are playing and the benefits they reap. For WSSU, um, we get to utilize the collective mechanism put together to support underrepresented minorities in pursuing opportunities to further their careers in STEM. We are primarily an undergraduate institution. So the collaborative is one avenue for our students to proceed to, to graduate studies. For today's goal, let me set the stage for the bigger picture of our conversation. Um, 
as an undergraduate student, why do I want to engage in research during my studies? What is the importance of a mentor to me? So these are questions any undergraduate student These are questions any undergraduate student might ask. If you are an undergraduate student and you do not know the answer to this question before, let me provide some thoughts now. There is often a gap between what is taught in the classroom and what students need to succeed. The only way you can bridge that gap is by finding a good research mentor and engaging in some form of undergraduate research. A good mentor will act as a a good mentor will act as a vehicle for provoking greater expectations from a student. Good mentorship also provides excellent ways to gauge whether a student is prepared to succeed in um, post baccalaureate endeavors, graduate studies, or the industry. Um, it is surprising to note that mentorship is still a eating pedagogy as well as a high impact practice in under, undergraduate education. So any institution that places a high value on mentoring students will set the stage to build a vital bridge between the traditional classroom and the preparation experience essential for graduate schools, um, corporations, businesses, and industry demand. So given the current um, COVID-19 crisis at the end of 2019 and the need for um, physical distancing and isolation, most um, research were disrupted. In the light of a rapid um, society change in response to the pandemic, um, research labs have actually struggled to adjust. What we will discuss today is the benefits of undergraduate research and some of the manipulations possible in a pandemic environment. The conversation we'll have today will not be exhaustive, but rather a starting point for a fundamental shift in how research is gonna be conducted moving forward. I'm now gonna pass you on to our first panelist who is um, Dr. John Mal who will um, introduce himself and continue with the conversation. So Dr. Mal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Canoe. Um, my name is John Merle, and I'm the chair of the chemistry department at Winston-Salem State University. Uh, I've been asked to talk about a couple of topics on research. Um, one is, what does, when does research take place? Um, and the other is what are the benefits to students, undergraduate students of performing research? So I am a computational chemist and I commonly use a program called Gaussian. And I don't know if anybody's used this, but at the end of a job, you get, an, you get a quote usually, some sort of quote. And one quote that I've obtained that I really like and is um, topical to research is one by Werner von Braun. Um, Werner was a, a developer of rockets in Germany during the war, but he immigrated to the US and was really a pioneer in US rocketry um, leading to NASA missions. So his quote is, research is what I am doing when I don't know what I am doing. And the reason I like this, especially in the, in the context of, of student research, is that it sort of breaks down the boundaries um, for undergraduate students to what can be considered research. Um, students often, um, Think of research as this daunting topic that is really related to, to very difficult STEM topics. And in fact, it's really not. Um, 
research can really be applied anywhere um, and at any time. It, it, it can be applied to, you know, your first day on the job. You don't know how long it's gonna take you to drive to your job. Well, what you would do is you would probably over a number of days collect some data as to how long it takes you to get to your job and you would come to some conclusion. And that's all research is, is collecting some sort of data and coming to a solution which creates some new knowledge. Um, so while research can be very simple in the STEM areas, it does require a little bit more effort. Um, so that's why you want to, to do undergraduate research at your institution. So for students in academia, undergraduate research typically takes place in a faculty member's research lab. Um, in this lab, you will learn techniques, um, usually some sort of instrumentation, some way to collect data, and you're, you will gain some skills to help you collect that data and analyze it. And, and these skills generally come from your interactions um, between yourself and your mentor. Um, but that's not the only place that research can occur. It is occurring in classrooms now. Um, our department is in the process of working with the Council of Undergraduate Research to implement research activities within courses. So for example, we have some in general chemistry labs, organic chemistry labs. Um, so you can do these research activities um, in classes as well. But oftentimes you wanna do some sort of literature search or look at journal articles or read books on certain topics. Um, so you may be working in the library. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So what are the benefits of doing research? Uh, I like the question that was asked at the beginning um, on the Mentimeter um, because I saw a lot of responses that are the same as the responses that um, I indicated in this slide. So one thing, especially for undergraduate students, is it helps you understand course content that you're probably currently struggling with. Um, it helps you think of the content in the context of solving some sort of real problem. And in the process, you're gaining new knowledge. And I think this particularly is very motivating. Um, it's motiv motivating in several aspects. Uh, you're excited because you've completed a project and you've created this new knowledge. Um, but in addition to just completing that project, this may improve your excitement for the degree that you're trying to complete and sort of propel you through that degree. Um, but it also probably gives you a sense of belonging um, in your STEM field and, and in your area of research. These, these research activities are also um, sort of OJT. I put OJT to represent on the job training, right? So if you're going out to get a job, there's nothing better than already having some sort of training in that area. And that will improve your prospects for obtaining the job that you're trying to um, obtain. It, it helps you understand how knowledge is actually created. We're starting to sort of get a little bit deeper here, right? When you create knowledge, as I indicated before, um, when we were determining how to go how long it's gonna take you to get to work. So in the lab and in a STEM lab, 
you're going to need to understand how to create the data. Um, this is usually using some sort of unique instrument. Um, you're going to have to know how to interpret that data. And then in order to let people know that you created this new knowledge, you might want to create a manuscript and give a presentation. And these are all very good skills um, ranging from communication, collection of data, and critical thinking as well as you interpret that data. Um, and of course, the ability to research is an extremely valuable job skill, whether you're going on to a job, whether you're going to go to grad school, um, people are going to want to know whether or not you have these skills of communication, um, leadership, the confidence that you generate when you um, do your research and create knowledge, but also have good critical thinking skills. So, so hopefully I've covered the main areas of, of how research benefits students, especially undergraduate students. And, and I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, let's move over to Dr. Shula now. And um, she's going to introduce herself and also continue with the conversation. Dr. Shula, the floor is yours. I'm here. I'm sorry, I was muted. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hesera Schuler, and I am the academic and professional de development person for the Department of Biological Sciences, and I'm the advisor to our pre-physician assistant students. So I have the pleasure of answering the question of what are the benefits to the mentor? So going back to Dr. Canoe's statement earlier, I think it's important before we answer that question to get a better understanding of what a mentor is. And that is one of the things that I enjoy doing. So being a mentor first starts off with being intentional, making yourself available to provide support and advice to your mentee. And the reason I say it must be intentional because it's going to require a lot of time and effort on your part as the mentor. And it also is a way to build a relationship with the mentee. I have had the pleasure of not only building relationships with my mentees, but they are lifelong, meaning that I've had mentors, excuse me, mentees that have started in the undergraduate program. And most of them now are in the profession, whether it's medical, medical or research or in the industry. So what are the benefits? First, there's the contentment that is just priceless when you're helping someone to develop professionally. And there's that feeling that you have accomplished something that is making a great contribution to society. You also have that opportunity to build a network of other mentees on your campus, and off campus. So what do you mean by that, Dr. Schuler? On campus, of course, that involves the students that enrolled in your, on your campus. I have extended myself across our campus at WSSU. So I'm just not a, have availed myself to those that are in biology and chemistry, but those who are in any study on, at WSSU. Off campus during COVID was an opportunity to, for me one of my lone life mentees came up with the idea of helping some postdocs at a certain uh, institution. So I did. That started back in the third week of March of 2020. We decided to start meeting on Saturdays. And from those meetings, I built a safe zone and we came up with the idea to let's write. And so now we have it, uh, published four papers since COVID. We met last night and we're now um, writing up a case study to address mentoring during COVID. So a lot of things have come out of that. So your uh, network can, uh, is expanded in so many ways. 
again, going to not only expanding your network with mentees, but I get a chance to expand my network with colleagues on campus and off campus again, because now I'm now involved with programs uh, nationally and internationally. And so I'm meeting with people just about every day on getting ideas. What are you doing on your campus here in Boston? What are you doing on your campus here in Africa? What are y'all doing in England? So it has been a wonderful opportunity for me. Most importantly, I have developed so much professionally with the aid of my mentees. Well, how could that be so when they're younger than you? Well, it has now um, put me in a position where I always do a self-assessment. And not only do I do my own self-assessment, I allow them to assess me, then I allow my colleagues to assess me, and then I have some associates that I allow to assess, assess me. I'm always involved in workshops on how to improve as a professional. And so it has just been wonderful growing. And then most importantly, as I said before, you're making a um, significant contribution, not only in the future of STEM, but in the future of our society as a whole. I think it was during one of the uh, COVID announcements from our current president that we saw where Dr. Fauci is working with one of our African-American students who graduated from an HBCU. And she was on, a, she did a TED talk recently and she talked about how her mentor is influencing her ability to do the work that she's doing at NIH. So guys, it's a great, fulfilling, priceless opportunity to uh, make contributions to our future because as a mentor, that's my assessment that you are leading to the future, you're contributing to the future, and you are help building a better future. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so what are the benefits to higher education? And again, my list is not exhaustive, but <clears throat> one of the most important benefits is there's a increased potential for earnings. What do you mean by that? I know some people that do not have an education and they're making X number of dollars. Well, that may be true, but how good are they? What is their expertise? How many people are looking for them? How many people or employers are looking for that person that is a good collaborator? good problem solver. They can um, have critical thinking skills. Those are skills and abilities that you, I believe that you get as a researcher, as in the STEM program somewhere. Because as researchers, as we said, there's always discovery. You're always looking for new ideas, new theories, new concepts. You're always adding into current theories, concepts. You're expanding knowledge, you're making, uh, contributions to the literature. So I think those are important skills as far as making your money. Then your career path, they are less restricted. What I mean by that, the choices are limited. For example, we had a student who was a biology major and a chemistry minor, and her heart was set on research, research in cancer. And as she attended a internship program at one of our local universities, she discovered that there was an opportunity to work in the policy area of making policies for research. So she reached out to one of the directors in that area. The director was so amazed about her ability to learn and her willingness to learn. She is now one of the top policy makers when it comes to cancer research at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Another individual, she too wanted to go into the medical field. She came into our program, attended a several I mean, internship opportunities, and she made it through, I think, her second year in a graduate program. And she was just burnt out because not only was she going to a full-time student, she was working two full-time positions. And she decided to take a gap. It was during her gap that she was offered a job with a law, a law firm who is in, in charge of 
uh, approven patents for research. So now that's what she does. So again, your options are without restrictions when it comes for a career path. Then you have the benefit of a wider community. Why is that? Because you're always collaborating. You're always looking and discovering and, and working with others. And so as you're solving problems and you're building up your team, you are now serving a wider community. It's not just your community. Your research could be so important that it may serve the world. Then there are social and cultural reasons. Some of us are in research to make better, to address social unrest. Some of us are in research to address issues that are around health. Some of us are in research to just address the inequities and in whatever it may be when it comes to social issues. Then there are cultural reasons. We have some students that are looking at, re that are, have an interest in research where because of their cultural beliefs, their values, their family values, or their religious beliefs. Then the other ben benefit of having a higher education is that it builds that self-confidence, you're more responsible, you're more independent. And then you have those personal reasons to why you're wanting to go and, and obtain a terminal degree or even just a master's. And then it also broadens, of course, your interest and your knowledge base. And we should all be in that position as lifelong learners, just going out of research component. When the tax laws change, we have to learn the new tax laws. Why? Because we don't want to get into, in trouble with the IRS. And I also believe as you gain more knowledge, you have better health. You know what is the importance of taking care of your health. I see more students on our campus before COVID and after uh, since COVID has arrived, they are now drinking more water. I have seen more students with the Fitbit. They're wanting to make sure they do the exercise. I have more students asking, what can I take um, uh, with what over-the-counter uh, uh, vitamins and supplements can I take to make sure that if I do catch COVID that I can fight it off without some uh, hard drugs. So it, it also embedders your health. And most importantly, why spend all those years and hours in obtaining a terminal degree? I think you would have the best time of your life. It is fun. And it is the balance between work, getting in a lab, working in a classroom setting, and then there's that life. So you have to find that balance and you get a chance to meet some unique people. Uh, you have a chance to broaden your network and you build up a friendship base. There are opportunities to travel both nationally and internationally. So there's a lot of fun benefits into, your, into obtaining a higher education. Next slide. Okay, question, how did COVID-19 affect our research? Well, as I said before, a lot of our summer research programs, they were canceled. The investigating, uh, investigation and research projects that we had started before our spring break, they were, we could not finish those projects. And so they were incomplete for just a moment because we have a great team of professors who were able to become creative and what components they could do online. They were able to do that. And then we had this um, agreement where we could come in the building, some would come at a certain hour and do whatever they could do in the lab. And we, because we didn't want to make sure we was uh, applying to the social distance um, requirements that was instituted by our governor and our mayor. And so at the end, a lot of the projects were still incomplete because we could not finish everything. Then um, I believe, and this is just my personal belief, that some of the students' critical thinking skills were hampered because they were distant and some students had issues with not been able to log into the internet. Some students were lived in areas where there was no high speed internet. So we lost some of those abilities to help improve and develop their critical thinking skills that way. 
Most importantly, our mail service, FedEx uh, service was hampered with the delivery of research materials that were ordered. So when we were, we received a notice that we were going to be online, we had to pivot online and our campus was shut down and only essential workers were allowed on campus. There was no one in place to sign for the delivery of our materials. So then we had to come up and re send the uh, items back, reorder the items and have them sent to another part of campus to where the, one of the essential workers were, but then we had to be very selective because some of the materials restored, required being stored in a, a cold room or in a certain uh, temper, temp, temperature room, and they didn't have those capabilities. So in essence, the material went back to the vendor. And as I said, we had to pivot to our online communication. Students had to pivot as well to online communication with their professors. And unfortunately, some of our students just had a difficult time talking to a professor via Zoom or any other way <laughs> using online services. Some students just felt like they they lost that connection. Um, some students just didn't feel comfortable. Other students just said that it was just, we lost something and never could explain what that something was. So one of the things that we did to try to make students more comfortable was we had to make it fun. We just could not just go online and do as usual as, as it was face to face. So what was the fun part? We had to come up with trivia games. We had to uh, come up with um, winning prizes. And it was at first a little problem, but then the only thing we just had to um, learn the technology. That was the main problem, learning the technology. But once we start making it fun, the students open up. Right now, students, even though they're on winter break, they are still reaching out asking, can we have another trivia game? And one of the reasons is because we gave out $25 gift cards. <laughs> and, but it piqued their interest. So now I'm thinking about, okay, maybe I can just continue on with the journal club and say who writes the best whatever. You know, I might up the end and say a $50 gift card. So we have learned how to be creative with our communication sector. And so then, as I said before COVID, we had students who had, um, who were accepted or their abstracts were accepted for certain conferences. And then we found out that although they had been accepted pre-COVID and although the conference had uh, pivoted to online, they too had to become selective with the number of people that they could allow to attend the conference, even though it was online. And so a lot of our students, believe it or not, lost their spot only because if they had 200 Originally, they had to cut it down to about 10 or 15. So a lot of our students lost out on that. And of course, there was a, a big blow to their confidence. They just felt like, you know, it was no reason to continue. But we have a great chair, Dr. Bott. He found a way to maneuver and to allow them to present their abstracts here on our campus during a conference that Dr. Allen was in charge of. So it kind of worked out. And then um, the online research seminars, they have proven to be well. Students now, uh, some of our professors are allowing students to lead those seminars. And so it has really been a way for students to continue building on their critical thinking skills, building on their um, uh, professional skills and learning how to put a seminar together. Because if you continue on this path with my postdoc mentees, we are now doing uh, setting up for, we're gonna um, set up for a Gordon conference, which this is my first time doing that. And it requires a lot of work, uh, soliciting people for funds to have supported. And so 
teaching students now in the undergraduate program, what that looks like, how that, what work is required to actually put on a conference. And a Gordon conference, this is one of the largest conferences. And so we have uh, support, financial support from a lot of people. And that is coming because of Twitter. I was shocked. Uh, we put out a solicitation and schools from across the world are donating. And so that's very exciting to me. So those are the things that I have to say and we can go to the next slide. Um, is this the last one for you, Dr. Schiller? Yes. Okay, thank you. Th um, thank you very much. And let me just, um, before I continue to talking about um, some of the recruitment avenues, let me um, share briefly my experiences over the, um, during the COVID time. So um, our institution actually closed down in, in March of this year. Mm -hmm. And I think we were away for about two months off campus. And so um, some of us who were probably interested in research begin to find a way to navigate back into, into, into our research labs. Like for me, I was coming to the research lab on, on specific times during the day, but I'm there alone anyway, trying to um, catch up on projects that have actually fallen behind. And so over the summer, I decided that um, I needed some help with some other um, activities that were going on with research. And so I had to recruit a summer um, virtual research assistant and she was working offline um, on, um, um, off campus. And so some of the activities that she, she was also a new, um, new to research. This was the first research group that she actually joined. And so we started by doing some literature review, getting her to effectively use SciFinder and do some, some literature review and also um, summarizing those, those articles that, that she actually um, came across. And then something that she did was um, learning how to use specific software. For example, in one of my projects, uh, we needed um, to actually um, identify and um, determine the fragmentation pattern of certain, certain, certain um, organic structures. So she went on to learn some of these, how to use these softwares and eventually was able to um, use them over, over that time. She also processed some data and then did some writing as well. We are meeting actually through Zoom. Sometimes we meet during the day, other times we meet at night as well. Um, so, and then we move on to fall. We have to take steps in case you want to continue with research. Um, what are some of, the, um, some of the plans to put in place to be able to make sure that you don't create a cluster, a, a, a COVID cluster in the lab? So, um, we started by actually putting, writing up a plan ahead of time to think of what could be the challenges and also how we could address them ahead of time. So um, it, over, o, over the fall, I actually mentored about two students in the lab. And so some of the things we did on a daily basis was to assign sittings. And also um, we have like an everyday questionnaire related to the health issue. And then also we did temperature checks we are also cleaning um, surfaces before and after use. And then we have designated PPEs. Students must wear the mask at all time when they are in the lab. So that was my experience during the, during the COVID crisis. And now, um, how can a faculty recruit undergraduate students into their research? So let's start by looking at a Pew Research Center data um, this data show that 95%, um, 90%, and 82% of individuals age 13 to 17 for the 95%, 18 to 29 for the 90%, and 30 to 49 years of age for the 82% use some form of social media. We are talking about a broad reach for online advertisement and recruitment for, for research. Um, the online advert, um, advert avenue also has the potential to recruit populations typically considered ad, ad to reach. So studies using advertisement via social media have um, shown to be financially feasible. They are not much expensive. They attract many individuals. 
and they also have condensed recruitment periods. So what are some of the examples we're talking about? We're talking about Facebook and um, Twitter, Instagram as social and um, social media networks. You can also use dating apps as well. But if you go through that, that avenue, try to make sure you use those apps and most of the young people actually go. And um, things like Grindr and um, Scoff or Jacked can be used for those purposes. Um, one disadvantage of short recruitment effort is the limited um, or lack of access to the, to the internet. We have seen this a lot during the past two semesters. Suddenly we had to teach online and we find out that most of our students did not have internet access where they actually live. Uh, other traditional methods that can be applicable, um, you can use flyers on, on your campus. This is one um, um, strategy we use quite often. You can also do um, class online surveys for research. Um, you recruit um, initial participants, which you call seeds, and then you allow these participants to go on and recruit their friends in, in, in classes. This other strategy I've used in my research lab is that students who are working in my lab already, um, they have um, a task to actually um, try to recruit other students in their classes. In fact, one of the students that end up working in my research lab this semester was actually recruited to that avenue. So I see we have some time for, for questions. I'm going to open the floor now for questions. Let me stop here. If anybody has a question, please put it in the chat. And if, but if you want to speak as well, that's also possible. You can just raise your hand up and we can give you the floor. So let's open the floor for questions now. So while we are waiting for questions, I have some questions that came in um, earlier. Um, one of them is that um, all of us have gone through. Okay, before I go to that one, there is one question in the chat box. Um, we are you limited in the number of hours you could work on campus to do to do research? I think um, I can answer that question. Maybe Dr. Schiller can chime in as well if she was over the campus, if, if, if she was on the campus during, um, during the break. For me, um, there was no limit in the number of hours. Um, I think what we had to do was to sign a document that you're going to be on campus. Once you sign that document, you can come in as um, whenever you want to work. But um, what, one thing that we ensured we were doing is that um, you're not working in the lab with anybody. You're just there on your, on your own. And so you can come during the day, you can come at night based on your, your time availability. I don't know. That's if, correct. Yeah. Uh, we just had to fill out a form yeah. to indicate the time that we were actually going to arrive on campus and guesstimation of how long we were going to stay but even if we said we was going to stay two hours and it ended up being three to four, we just had to inform our chair who would then inform the dean. And so it was basically left up to you as the individual who were going into the lab. The only uh, other requirement, as Dr. Kunu has said, is that we had to make sure that we were uh, had our PPE and to make sure that um, we followed the guidelines according to what was in, instituted in our area from our governor when it came to, came to COVID. But to answer that question, the limit, there was no restriction. Mm -hmm. So one thing that uh, might be very helpful, especially if we have some students on the line, is for us to share some of our experiences as um, 
undergraduate student. So there was a question which, uh, what, what was your experience as an undergraduate student and how did you get into undergraduate research during that time? Who wants to go first? Repeat that, I'm sorry, Dr. Kanu. Yeah, what was your experience as an undergraduate student and how did you get into undergraduate research during that time? Hmm. My experience was fun. <laughs> 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 I made it fun because one of the things that for me, and it, and it is true for all students, is that uncertainty. I really was not sure what I wanted to study. I knew that I wanted to study something, but what that something was, I was clueless. And then I remember my professor made this comment, just read the literature, look at the trends, find out what pops up to you. And when I began to read the liter literature, everything was popping out to me. And I was not sure until I started talking to other students. And then it hit, okay, huh. No wonder she presented it the way she did because the professor did not want to guide it as far as my interest. She wanted me to be able to tell her. And so I did, I, after I got that patted down, I actually began to have that, again, that uncomfortability of, I don't know what's gonna happen next. What if this, what if I'd say this and this is wrong? What if, what if? And then I learned as I continue to add, uh, become comfortable with asking the what if questions, the uncertainties kind of eased off. And then I understood that it's all about exploring. It's all about exploring, it's all about discovery. So, <clears throat> In order to uh, narrow it down to a research topic, that was, that was no problem for me. And the more I got involved, the more I went through the methods, the more, especially when I started collecting the data, that was most exciting for me. I was so thrilled with the data collection process. And then it became, it became like your baby, like this is yours, you're responsible for this. And then my uh, professor, she was, so she gave us, she, was, she didn't put any restrictions on us. She just wanted us to discover. But she would ask, okay, did you think about trying this? And I was like, no, I didn't, what is that? And she would say, well, let's just see what would happen. And so again, collecting the data, analyzing the data, of course, learning statistics wasn't at first, I didn't think I was gonna be good at it, but then that too became my baby. So, I start using real life issues to help me hone in into my research. So it became, once I completed my first study, that was just it. I was ready to go on to the next thing. And it's still going, it's still going. It's either you like it or you don't. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ma, you wanna share something or? Yeah, I can just say, my first introduction to research came in a undergraduate class. It was physical chemistry lab. Um, we were required to do a, a bunch of typical labs, um, but we also needed to come up with a project um, working with one of the professors in the department. Um, so I worked with a professor in the department, um, I don't know, you know, when you're looking for mentors, make sure you look for mentors that like people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mine was sort of standoffish, but, but we got through it. Um, I did a lot of work on my own, but it was, it was satisfying. Um, I completed the project, ended up uh, presenting at a ACS meeting. Um, so it's good. Um, make sure that you you get that experience as an undergraduate, definitely. Thank you. Uh, my, my experience in that area was um, my undergraduate study was an honors program. And so by default, we were 
required to do a research project, a detailed research project and submitted a um, dissertation. And I think I worked on um, electrochemical cells. So one thing we were trying to look at was um, to determine the feasibility of certain types of reactions. So we have to set up these electrochemical cells and determine whether the reaction is possible. It was a very, very fun experiment. That was the very first time I tend to look at um, how um, um, current and those kind of things work. So up electrical equipment and to be able to get um, current as well as energy um, out of it. So it was very, very good experience for me during that time. Um, another question we have is that, um, how have we benefited from being an undergraduate research mentor? So if we could just summarize briefly each and every one of us so we can get to it within the time frame. Well, um, I think the biggest benefit, as I said previously, you are making contributions to the future. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, for me, um, there has been um, three, um, about three to four reasons why I think um, mentoring undergraduate students is beneficial. Um, the first one would be um, um, helping students to identify their strengths and weaknesses. Most of the time, most undergraduate students don't actually have a clarification of what those are. And so when they get to involve in, in research, um, we are able to summarize in a very quick period of time, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? And then we can work on um, improving on areas of, of, of weakness. One thing that I've been satisfied and, and a satisfaction to me is that um, I, I have, I'm capable of playing a role um, wherein I can provide students an environment where they can be successful, safe and confident in their ability in the end. Um, the second one, as a faculty member, we spend long time, long hours teaching lots of classes um, while conducting research, writing and reading at the same time, sometimes with very, very little pay. Um, and it's a way to remind me of I believe he froze. So while, while he's out, oh, here he is. Okay. Who is that? You, you stopped for a few seconds. Oh, I stopped? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I don't know where I, where I stopped anyway, but I was saying that um, it's, it's fulfilling to get students to, when they text, sometimes they text you late at night or early in the morning to tell you of their, of, of, of their successes. And that has been very, very fulfilling for me as a, as a mentor. And then um, finally, it reminds all, it also reminds me, there are a lot of challenges we have to go through. Some are administrative, some are departmental challenges. And so mentoring is a way to get me not to check out on, on research but to actually lean in a little bit. And then because I have students that are receiving benefits from what I'm, from what I'm doing. And so that would be another reason why I want to act as a mentor. Um, Dr. Ma, you want to summarize briefly or? Yeah, I think both uh, Dr. Schuler and yourself explained it pretty well. It's, it's satisfying to contribute to the knowledge of a student, to the development of a student, and then see them carry on and, and have successes and, and know yeah. that hopefully you contributed to some of that. You contributed to some of that, okay. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's one o'clock now. I want to thank our, our panelists for their tremendous contribution today. And I want to also thank all the attendees um, for attending this session. Um, we will actually be, um, this session will be posted on the um, 
you know, the chair website and other places. I'll be sending the recording to um, Ashley and then she will get to post up there. So it can be listened to at any time. And um, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.